Okay, thanks for being here. I want to welcome you here today to the CSE Colloquium. It's a great pleasure to welcome Peter Lee. Peter's a friend of mine for 20 plus years and a friend of uh, many of ours here. He's got uh, a long career. He was a grad student at the University of Michigan, faculty at Carnegie Mellon for many years, and uh, just this past summer took a leave of absence from uh, being head of the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon to start a new office at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. So uh, he and Drew Dean from his office have spent the whole day talking to people here. They've got uh, another couple hours after this talk, and uh, Peter's going to describe to us today his uh, experience in the first quarter at DARPA. So Peter, thanks for being here. Right. So uh, thanks, Ed. It's really, uh, really been a fun, fun day. Um, so uh, I, uh, I'm really, really thrilled to be here. Um, I uh, feel like uh, some really exciting things are happening at DARPA, and i um, always anxious to uh, tell people about it. Um, this is also kind of a difficult talk to give. Um, I've been at DARPA for less than five months, and the new office that I've been asked to create has been in existence for uh, only about four months, and so it's still a work in progress. Um, and so uh, uh, keep that in mind as we uh, go through. Um, now, to start, um, I call this just Peter at DARPA because I felt like I was coming uh, to talk to friends and, um, and that many of you uh, uh, know me. But, of course, uh, DARPA is something that might not be familiar to some of you. I suspect it's familiar to most of you. But uh, just in one slide, uh, DARPA was formed uh, in the wake of the launch of Sputnik, which was, of course, this cathartic technological surprise. Uh, for the U.S. and uh, DARPA's founding charter was to prevent and uh, when opportunity presents, it, presents itself to create technological surprise. Um, uh, since then, uh, DARPA has really done a lot of pretty amazing uh, kind of mission-oriented science and technology and engineering development. Uh, it was involved in uh, the development of GPS and in fact, in the launch of the first uh, satellites. Um, it uh, embarked on the mission to create an invisible airplane, which uh, led ultimately to uh, stealth technology. Uh, there's been a very long uh, history of uh, work in robotics and uh, things related to robotics that now are being used for some uh, pretty uh, amazing advanced prosthetics uh, work. And of course, um, something that all of us who are computer scientists in the room are very familiar with uh, is uh, the ARPANET, which just over 40 years ago uh, was born. And I'll say much more about uh, 40 years ago, since that was a big uh, year uh, for science and technology in the, in the US. Uh, but all of these things, and many, many more, uh, have been uh, kind of integral parts of the science and technology landscape in our country, and in fact, the world, uh, and all had some uh, origins uh, out of DARPA. So now, uh, I'm at DARPA. Uh, not where I expect it to be uh, right now. I, uh, I was holding what I thought was the best academic job in the U.S. Um, it was not something I thought uh, about leaving anytime soon, uh, even just for a temporary period. Um, and so how did I end up there? Um, well, after the uh, election, uh, there was a transition team. Uh, Berkeley's Tom Khalil was asked to, uh, to chair a science technology committee. Uh, Tom talked to Ed Lazowska. Uh, Ed uh, mobilized a whole bunch of people to write two-page position papers on uh, S&T issues of national importance. And uh, the, one of the two-page position papers that came to me uh, as a, an assignment, my Christmas vacation homework assignment from Ed Lazowska, uh, was to write a piece on re-envisioning DARPA. And so, uh, so I did that. Uh, I wrote a couple of drafts. Uh, after some discussions with Ed and others, decided that it might have more impact if someone else, um, not from Carnegie Mellon, uh, you know, would join. Maybe someone else as a co-author who had uh, bona fide DARPA experience, and so uh, asked Randy Katz to join. He gladly uh, agreed and uh, and made significant revisions and uh, and improvements to the text. Uh, now, at this point, I really wish I'd put his name first. Uh, in the authorship list, uh, things might have turned out differently. Um, but in fact, this document um, ended up being um, uh, one of the pieces that kept getting um, thrown back at me 
uh, as uh, people were trying to talk me into coming to DARPA. Um, not just uh, fellow academics and my colleagues, uh, but people in the government. Um, and uh, as things took shape, um, uh, I thought more and more seriously about this. Um, the kicker, uh, however, was the appointment of Regina Dugan as the new DARPA director. Um, and Regina is, uh, of course, the first woman uh, director of the agency, uh, but she's also a friend of mine and someone who I've had um, several interactions with over the past uh, 12 or 13 years. Uh, and I sincerely hope you all have a chance to meet her uh, sometime. She really is a, a very, very interesting person, very dynamic, uh, and has a, a lot of great vision. And the combination of all these factors, plus uh, Regina Dugan being appointed the agency director, um, really made it impossible for me uh, to say no, so I'm there. Now, um, uh, Regina is um, a very sharp planner and thinker. Um, has very clear vision about what she wants to accomplish. And so in the discussions that I had with her, she had very specific missions, very specific tasks for me to accomplish. Um, there were numerous, but the main three are listed here. One is to focus on strategic surprise. And I'll explain more about uh, what's meant by that, um, but roughly speaking uh, is to really regain an emphasis at DARPA, at least in one office, if not agency-wide, uh, on trying to understand and, and anticipate the problems that we don't know about yet. It's one thing to look at what our warfighters are struggling with today, identify technical problems and go after them, but it's a somewhat different and important task to try to place ourselves in a position to better anticipate the problems that could arise tomorrow or next year or 10 years from now. And so uh, maybe the most important thing I've been asked to do is to try to do that. A pretty tall order. Um, in fact, when I arrived at DARPA, sitting in an office, I'm all alone. The office is just me. I have really no idea at that moment how one tries to anticipate strategic surprise. And so I'll tell you uh, uh, where I've gone with that. Uh, second is to establish a new office, and the director uh, had referred to this as a megatrends office. I'll explain uh, to you more about what that is. And then finally, to help strategize about how to re-engage uh, with the best and brightest uh, researchers in the country, uh, including and in particular uh, academic researchers. And so these were the three missions. So, and so what I'd like to do is just go through these three uh, one by one and uh, explain what I've been up to. All right. Now, before I dive in, uh, a couple of things. One is, uh, it's still very early days. And at, toward the end of the talk, I'll give you an idea of where we stand right now. Um, but uh, it's only been six months for the new director, uh, five months, uh, a little bit less for me uh, being at DARPA, and only about four months for this new office. And so uh, things aren't it's still a work in progress, and maybe another way of saying it is that uh, we're still highly impressionable. We're just really looking for great ideas and directions to go and, uh, and places to stay away from. Uh, secondly, the slides I'm about to show you, uh, if you know my research, uh, it's more in theoretical uh, aspects of programming languages and program analysis. Uh, many of you know my papers tend to have a lot of Greek in them. Um, the slides and that's my comfort zone. The slides I'm going to show you aren't like that. Um, there are lots of pictures. It's almost like a slideshow. Uh, don't think less of me uh, for that. <laughs> the, um, uh, but it's the state of the thinking right now. And some of these slides are slides uh, that I've used with DOD leadership, with the four stars in the services, with the Secretary of Defense. Uh, where we're really talking at a very strategic level. And so I wanted to expose um, some of that uh, presentation style uh, to you as well. Okay? So let's go. So let's start, first of all, uh, on this idea of strategic surprise. So think about it. Uh, a DARPA office is very much like a department in a university, roughly speaking. Maybe, it maybe has a lot more money, but it gives it away to other people instead of spending it on itself. <laughs> Um, and so it's very much a good department. And so you're supposed to create the Department of Strategic Surprise. You know, how on earth are you going to do that? 
And what does that even mean? Well, um, Regina Dugan herself uh, has a number of ways of talking about this. And let me just borrow one slide from her. And it's actually uh, a, a test. And so I'll refer to this, to this as the director's test. So I'm going to show you a picture of a bunch of uh, colored dots. And if you've been tested by this before, don't ruin it for everyone else. Uh, but what I want you to do, and I'll give you five seconds, I want you to count the red number of red dots. OK, everyone ready? OK, here we go. Five seconds. OK, so how many blue dots were there? <laughs> OK, so what's the point of this? Why does the uh, director show this? Well, we have wars going on, conflicts, and the military really has to focus on its mission. And if its mission is to count the red dots, it has to be absolutely single-minded and make sure it accomplishes that goal. An agency like DARPA, though, with its mandate to prevent and create surprise, has a different mission. It is the part of the Defense Department that has to count the blue dots, count the purple dots, count the yellow dots, see if they're triangles, and really try to look at things and slice and dice them in all different ways in order to prevent the possibility that we might be caught out, just in case we need to know these other things. And so there is always a sense at which DARPA is trying to take people out of their boxes, take people out of their comfort zones, and challenge conventional thinking. Now, that's easy enough to say, but how do you do that? And so as I've built up a team um, uh, in the new office uh, and just meditated on this uh, question, uh, I've arrived at a few different approaches. And maybe you have your own that you could suggest to me later. But let me run through some of the approaches that I've, I've taken. So the first thing to do is let's go back to uh, 1969 and the uh, first landing on the moon. This is a picture of Neil Armstrong on the moon. Uh, truly a monumental uh, technical accomplishment. Thousands of uh, technical innovations um, and just as uh, amazing was the marshalling of over 65,000 people all collaborating on the same goal of putting this man on the moon. Uh, really a monumental achievement. In that same year, uh, the ARPANET was born. And in fact, by the end of that year, there were four nodes in the ARPANET. And Doug Engelbart conducted the mother of all demos, where he had this amazing way of thinking about a network, not just as a piece of technology, but as a tool for, uh, as it's quoted here, augmenting human intellect. And so this idea of taking these fuzzy uh, kind of intelligence and social science notions and demonstrating, uh, building a mouse and demonstrating the idea that people in geographically disparate locations around the world could collaborate on problem solving and document preparation was also uh, an amazing accomplishment. Uh, and this uh, slide, by the way, uh, I uh, obtained from Pat Lincoln at SRI. And so it has an SRI feel to it. But it's still a monumental science technology achievement, uh, nonetheless, even if you're not from SRI. So a question we can ask is, uh, these two amazing things that happened in 1969, uh, both also have an ARPA imprint. Uh, ARPA was born. Uh, as, the, at the, as the start of the space race. And in fact, ARPA order number one uh, contributed uh, to technologies in the Saturn V booster. Uh, and then the uh, ARPA-funded effort uh, around the ARPANET and uh, Engelbart's demo, uh, demo. Just amazing, amazing achievements all in the same year. And if we ask the question, which had more impact? Uh, maybe it's a silly question, because it's, uh, they're not really comparable, and they're both really amazing. In fact, I'm fond of saying that I wouldn't be a scientist today if it weren't for watching the moon landing as a, as a small child. Uh, well, one way to answer this question, the way that I believe, is uh, that, in fact, uh, there is no comparison. My son hasn't used Saturn V booster technology to reinforce his school lessons. Um, he hasn't used lunar landing technology uh, to entertain himself. 
Um, and of course, uh, people haven't downloaded porn using uh, uh, you know, docking technologies either. The point here <laughs> is that the incredible reach of technologies, when they have the opportunity to become truly democratized and reach uh, virtually everyone on the globe, that idea of democratization can lead to surprisingly disruptive results. Huge disruptions, and you see them every day. Uh, some of them, of course, uh, get bandied about in the news all the time because, in fact, they're even threatening the whole news industry. Uh, and, and so how do we account for these things? And as we've embarked on trying to create a new program office at DARPA that's really trying to anticipate surprises like this, one place we've looked is to look at technological and social trends that are showing the kinds of exponential growth and trend toward democratization that could be disruptive. Now, uh, just before I actually started officially at DARPA, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Gates, uh, visited DARPA. And so uh, Regina Dugan asked me to spend a few minutes with him. And I had no idea what to talk to him about. I mean, I hadn't even started there. And I decided I wanted to tell him a story about democratization. Now, I was making drives back and forth to Washington from Pittsburgh, where I live, uh, in order to meet with people at DARPA. And unfortunately, I was getting speeding tickets. Uh, and it was a real problem, because as I was imagining not moving my wife and son from Pittsburgh and doing this commute, uh, it would be big trouble if I lost my license. And so this is what saved me. Uh, now, I should explain, I have a very, very good radar detector, uh, razor radar detector, but I was still getting tickets. Uh, but this thing has solved my problems. And those of you who aren't uh, familiar with this, this is an iPhone application uh, called Trapster. And what Trapster does, as you can see here, as you're driving along, it uses the GPS and uh, internet capabilities on the iPhone to give me a verbal warning whenever I'm approaching a recently spotted speed camera or speed trap. Okay? And if I see one, I can report that uh, just by touching this button. And in fact, when I see a speed trap that's been reported by someone else, uh, I get a dig like thumbs up and thumbs down so I can rate the quality of that report. And that raises people's uh, social standing in the social network. And so there's social media involved. Uh, you can dynamically form convoys, uh, all sorts of wonderful uh, tools here. <laughs> okay. um, and in fact, as of last October, uh, there were 50,000 downloads a day of this tool. And of course, the more and more people uh, that download this, the better it gets, uh, and the fewer uh, false uh, reports there are, because the whole thing kind of reinforces itself uh, using social media. This is another example of, how, of technology democratization at work. The convergence of ubiquitous access to GPS, to cloud computing resources for mapping and for social media, uh, for uh, mobile internet, you know, all converge here to create something completely disruptive and something that changes the game. The standard game that I, as a motorist, and the Maryland State Police were playing, okay, where there's measure, countermeasure. They have a radar detector, I get a, uh, they have a radar, I get a radar detector, they get a laser, I get a laser detector, and we keep going back and forth. The game is now changed. And so when we talk about game changers, technology democratization is one way to anticipate the possibility of game changing technologies, both for our own opportunities and capabilities, but also as uh, threats uh, from uh, asymmetric uh, adversaries. Um, of course, um, sometimes it takes a little bit of a leap of imagination to see the military uh, relevance of that. Uh, here's a one that's a little easier uh, to see. And this is a Google mashup that was started by a graduate student uh, at George Mason University who went on a guided tour of North Korea, actually went on a couple just out of interest, uh, and created a, a mashup to just record the things that uh, he had seen. That attracted the interest of some former military, uh, from people who had relatives in Korea, other people that the Wall Street Journal called busybodies, who had you know, just spent a lot of time reading newspaper reports, connecting the dots, looking at pixels, uh, to the point now where 
uh, a very large part of the critical infrastructure of North Korea has been mapped out, including uh, about 200 anti-aircraft battery locations, the secret location of Camp 16, the mass burial sites from the last famine, and so on. Pretty amazing. And all instigated by a graduate student with no ability to hire thousands of analysts and launch billion dollar satellites. And so, again, we see this idea of democratization at work and the ability for anyone to achieve a situational understanding uh, that rivals uh, what very large nations uh, are able to do. So it's, uh, again, an example of democratization in action. And in fact, all of these examples also, in fact, a factor in uh, democratization uh, are technologies with, uh, that exhibit exponential trends. And so as, uh, as our team has tried to sift through all of the possibilities, one thing we've always tried to do is to see if there are clear trend lines where we see exponential growth or uh, decrease curves, uh, colliding exponentials, uh, that uh, point to the possibility uh, that things like this might happen. Uh, here's another example. Of course, you're all familiar with the internet and there's uh, uh, exponential curves galore. Um, but in biology, uh, we see some of the same things. We are seeing an exponential decrease in the cost of gene assembly and an exponential increase in our ability uh, to uh, do gene assembly, uh, typically uh, with some type of predictable, predictable outcome. And so when you see those exponentials starting to intersect, that starts to attract more and more curious people. And that community shows every sign of being able to grow exponentially if only provided a little bit of incentive, maybe funding incentive. So if we look at the uh, annual iGEM Jamboree, um, we see uh, every year a significant growth in the number of people that are attending. And it's really growing very rapidly. And in the last iGEM Jamboree from last Halloween, uh, I was uh, really struck uh, with some of the creativity of the student-led projects in particular uh, that came out of, out of this. And so what are the possibilities uh, if we are able to track this exponential trend, say, for another five to eight years? Uh, if you do the calculations uh, on uh, numbers of base pairs, for example, uh, you get to some pretty interesting numbers. And the possible uh, threats and also opportunities for us um, could be very, very surprising. And so this is another area where uh, we try to do some analysis and, and figure out where to go. Now, on a completely different tack, another major concept that looms large here is what the business people call open innovation. And what's meant by open innovation? Um, well, uh, there is actually a taxonomy of this, which I'll show later. Um, but one area of open innovation uh, basically pertains to reaching out to uh, communities beyond, let's say, uh, uh, the DARPA contractors uh, or beyond the university community, uh, even looking at mass participation by the general public. Um, last week, I know Dan Kaufman was here, and he was uh, intimately involved uh, with a program um, with Zoran Popovich here on Foldit. And Foldit is one example of open innovation. When you have open competitions, you really invite and create an incentive structure based on competitive pressure uh, that enables you to achieve surprising results, even disruptive results, in the ability to uh, understand the structure of proteins. Uh, also, to find people out in the world who are unusually good, even without any formal training, uh, at understanding um, uh, the folding structure of proteins. Um, of course, DARPA itself has been experimenting with this. Uh, in our office, the deputy director, Norm Whitaker, was the manager, program manager for the DARPA Urban Challenge. And uh, uh, while the top academic uh, and industrial teams um, really uh, did the best, the range of competitors uh, from garage mechanics and uh, student-led groups um, was, pretty, uh, was pretty amazing, especially amazing 
when you consider the high barrier to entry and the high cost of entry uh, for a, a robot race like this. Um, our office, uh, last December, on December 5th, uh, we staged uh, our first open competition, uh, first of, uh, we hope, uh, several competitions. Uh, this one in the social networking space uh, called the DARPA Network Challenge. And this was in commemoration of the 40th anniversary of the uh, ARPANET. And what we did is we hid eight-foot weather balloons. Uh, they were tethered to the ground, uh, hoisted 100 feet in the air, in public but undisclosed locations in the United States. Um, and we said anyone who can report the latitude and longitude of these balloons first would win $40,000 in commemoration of the 40 years. Uh, to our surprise, almost 4,400 teams registered for this competition, including about 250 teams from outside of the US, including Russia, India, Brazil, Iran, the Sudan, China, really all over the world. Um, I was at the uh, balloon in San Francisco, and that was the first uh, balloon location to be reported by a team, a team of psychics, of, uh, of all people. And so it was pretty amazing. That's the only balloon they found. Um, <laughs> The, um, but it was uh, really uh, quite an amazing thing. And uh, if you watched uh, the news, the uh, team from MIT uh, used a fairly innovative recursive incentive structure. Uh, and they were able to mobilize uh, within 48 hours a very large army of people, um, both to look for balloons and also to verify um, unverified balloon sightings. And so they were quite impressive. But there were also teams of uh, existing social networks like the Nerd Fighters and the Geocachers and the Lance Armstrong Foundation and so on that did very well, uh, as well as tech companies like Google. Uh, all uh, uh, were really credible uh, competitors. And so in this situation, uh, we wanted to explore the viral diffusion of information in social networks and the mobilization of social networks in short time, but to do so in a military context. And by that I mean in a context that's highly adversarial. And so while we are beginning to understand a lot about cascades and viral diffusion of information, uh, typically that's not done in situations where there are people who have strong incentives to keep secrets and to lie, cheat, and steal. Um, and in fact, there were hundreds of uh, false reports spread intentionally uh, as well as unintentionally, uh, decoy balloons hoisted, uh, beautifully photoshopped images, uh, and, and, uh, and even some cyber, attempted cyber attacks to cause people's DNS to go to spoof uh, balloon reporting websites um, in other countries. And so it was really uh, a very interesting uh, experiment. Uh, and um, I'm hoping that we'll see some good uh, academic papers coming out of this in the next few months. Um, now, I mentioned about the taxonomy of open innovation. And um, one way that business school people talk about open innovation is to look uh, at a taxonomy where you have a kind of a solution space going from kind of centralized to network-centric or diffused um, uh, solutions and a problem space from highly structured problems to kind of emergent problems. And if you think about uh, co open competitions, they're sort of up in that uh, quadrant, you know, where basically, you know, we're uh, we want to say uh, what we want is uh, some type of, of absolute uh, kind of, uh, there are no beauty contests here. We have an absolute set metric uh, for who wins and who loses. Um, but how you approach the uh, problem, um, the methods that you use, uh, is really up to you. And it's completely open. Um, and that's in contrast to something like the iTunes App Store, um, where you really have structure in both cases, where you have a set platform um, and a set uh, way of um, putting things together. And here, um, our office jointly with the Tactical Technologies Office uh, put out a request for input uh, on uh, an idea. There's, um, you can't see this fuzzy picture. There are three little volleyballs. They're actually satellites. They're miniature space satellites. Um, these are prototypes, so they're not let out of the International Space Station, so they're only allowed in the space station. Um, but uh, we want to develop an interface that would uh, allow many people, maybe high school students, grade school students, to be able to access and program these things to do things. So, you know, where could we, how could we tap into 
uh, innovative ideas uh, from the crowd that way. And so we're interested in your input there. And so again, it's uh, really setting up that platform. Uh, when you have mashups, you know, you really again have a set platform, um, but you're really, uh, what that platform is used for is uh, really up to the crowds. Um, North Korea Uncovered is like that. Um, one thing that you'll see uh, very soon is we will have robotics programs, and we'll have robotics programs where we will contract with the academic and industrial researchers, but look for the same robot hardware to be available in public spaces like museums, uh, where uh, people in the general public or in the larger artist technology community can access and, and uh, present code uh, uh, in social settings uh, in order to gain their uh, innovations. And then uh, that upper right corner, I don't really know what to do with at all. Um, there are very interesting uh, things in the intersection, for example, of bio and medicine and computing, such as the Tropical Disease, Disease Initiative. It's a model for something that's really completely emergent uh, and, and open, um, and uh, what we should be doing here is unclear. The point here is that in all of these quadrants, we see surprises, technological and strategic surprises, coming out over and over and over again. And so uh, in our office, we're very interested in exploring uh, all four quadrants of this open innovation space. And then, so we talked about uh, technology democratization and open innovation. Uh, third dimension in the search for surprise is in pushing boundaries. And roughly speaking, uh, these are areas where people in polite societies like ours uh, tend to avoid thinking about. Now, uh, some of these things uh, pertain to uh, issues uh, having to do with safety or ethical issues or privacy. Um, and we can't assume that future adversaries uh, would have similar uh, blank spots in their uh, thinking. And so in our office, we try to force ourselves to feel uncomfortable and push various boundaries. Now, I've put this idea in pretty stark terms, um, but actually, boundary pushing or making people feel uncomfortable can happen in much simpler ways as well. For example, let's just take the very mundane uh, idea of acquisition, defense acquisitions, the task of actually getting new technology and new equipment into the military. It's a long, arduous process. This picture uh, shows uh, the tactical, quiet power generator. So it's a fuel cell-based uh, piece of technology. Um, it's really impressive, generates a lot of electricity very, very quietly. And so it can be used to uh, power a forward base and, and not reveal, not have a big heat signature, not have a big noise signature. Um, this picture I thought was really, really cool because this soldier, I don't know if you can see what he's doing. Can anyone see what he's doing? He's charging his iPod. Now, um, what's going on here? Well, it turns out that uh, soldiers, especially in their second deployments, are spending a lot of money, close to $1,000 out of their own money to equip themselves uh, as they go out. And there's, that's a sign of kind of latent innovation, where we have soldiers who really, based on their own experience, are innovating in the kinds of equipment that they think they need. And they're circumventing the acquisition process uh, to do this. And so we can ask the question, well, are there IT-enabled, computing-enabled uh, acquisition models that might allow a more uh, dynamic uh, equipping of our warfighters? You know, what if we supplied soldiers with modern handsets? That itself might have to go through a standard acquisition process. But what about the applications? Would we go through the standard military acquisition process of writing a requirement specification for every app that we think we might want, having requests for proposals and giving a contract? Or would we create a social, online social space where developers and warfighters were able to express their concerns and their needs and then create a competitive market uh, where people are motivated by the numbers of downloads as opposed uh, to a requirements document. And so while this isn't computer science research, it's 
just fundamentally computing enabled uh, to be able to kind of create that online space that directly connects developers uh, with, uh, with the end users. And so can we do that? And this is an, uh, an example that really pushes the boundaries, really ends up worrying and scaring some people. It just takes people way out of their comfort zones. Another example uh, is depicted here. Uh, this is a picture of um, some of the protests uh, in the wake of the uh, Iranian election uh, last June. And uh, as many of you know, um, at the height of those protests, uh, Twitter was used uh, extensively, and at one point hitting about 220,000 tweets per hour. Um, and, uh, and this really uh, reverberated around the world. And then suddenly, one day, it all stopped. Now, uh, exactly why, uh, we don't know. But one could surmise, just imagining how we would try to stop that traffic, uh, one could imagine that various technologies that maybe were developed for defensive purposes uh, were employed to suppress free expression and the cause of freedom and democracy. And so we can ask the question, uh, should we try to develop technologies that go directly against the trend towards removing anonymity um, uh, on the internet? And again, these are questions and potential investments and projects that would directly contradict ongoing investments by the Defense Department. And in that way, uh, we're pushing boundaries and hoping to uncover surprises. And so uh, these are uh, examples of uh, this third category. Now, all of this technology democratization, uh, uh, pushing boundaries, and open innovation, to my mind, are all made possible through computer science. And maybe I'm a bigot because I'm a computer scientist, but I just see the world and see the future of this all being driven by computing. And in fact, it drives more and more of a need for computing. And so uh, another element of all of this is to really understand and track you know, what's coming next in computing technology and try to get there first. Now, uh, there are lots of things happening here. And what are the drivers for more and more computing technology and power? Well, I spent some time talking about social media and social networks. And doing the social media network analysis has driven a lot of very interesting research. Uh, some research that came out of uh, some PhD work by Yuri Leskovec at CMU, and uh, who is now at Stanford, uh, pertains to developing compact mathematical models that have some predictive power in the uh, characteristics of um, real world social networks. And similarly, uh, there are some emerging algorithms uh, that are you know, still quite challenging in terms of the amount of computing power that they need, uh, but are able to uncover really very, very interesting uh, characteristics of uh, very large dynamic graph structures and uh, social networks. And uh, getting enough computing power to do these things uh, uh, contributes directly to our abilities to communicate strategically and to mobilize uh, quickly on, on networks. Um, th the office that uh, we're creating here, uh, because of this, has inherited um, a large number of the core computing programs at DARPA, including the high-performance computing uh, programs. And so the High Productivity Computing Systems Program, HPCS, uh, is in our office. And uh, under construction right now uh, is the Blue Waters machine, um, which uh, has IBM technology that's uh, 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 based directly on the technology out of this program. Uh, here is, it's under construction. These are just power units. The missing computer is in here. It's under construction. Uh, there's a new building there in the NCSA for this. Um, but beyond that, going beyond what we currently see as uh, approaching the end of the roadmap for big supercomputers, uh, we see all sorts of growth curves that are hitting walls in the near future. And so the question is, uh, how can we get beyond this? And in fact, from my point of view, uh, I want to get to the end of these CMOS and Moore's Law roadmaps first, uh, and then I want to know what lies beyond. And as we look at the computing needs for the Defense Department, one thing we realize is that we want and need the greater computing power, but at much, much reduced 
uh, power requirements. In fact, by some calculations, we need a reduction of uh, a thousandfold in the energy requirements uh, for um, uh, airborne uh, computing systems. So we want to retain current or greater computing power, but at a thousandfold uh, less energy. And when you start to do that, then you get into significant questions about uh, the operating systems, the programming languages and programming methodologies, uh, and in fact, the whole software stack uh, on, on these future systems. And so uh, this isn't multi-core. This is really trying to look well beyond multi-core, uh, still in the CMOS regime, um, but reimagine uh, if we wanted to achieve these energy targets, uh, how would we do it? And every thought process that we've conducted on this brings you down the same road of really completely rethinking uh, the processor architecture, the system architecture, and, and the whole software stack. So, um, so look uh, mo uh, very soon for uh, new programs uh, uh, along these lines. So this was uh, kind of the uh, issue of strategic surprise where we've been looking for markers that include uh, technology democratization, exponential trends, pushing boundaries, open innovation, uh, and all in the foundation of uh, future computing systems. And to do all of that, uh, I was asked to start a new office. And so what is this new office? Well, um, you know, if you think about uh, this, uh, Tom Khalil, uh, in the uh, Science and Technology Policy Office um, referred to this office as just as much about new attitudes as new technologies. And in fact, you see that in talking about pushing boundaries uh, and thinking about democratization. Um, and in fact, when Regina Dugan came to the agency, she created two new offices. So at the start, uh, there were these uh, five, uh, five offices, um, three offices which uh, I refer to as technology offices, uh, defense sciences uh, is really the home for uh, basic uh, research in mathematics, physics, materials, uh, chemistry. Um, information processing techniques office, uh, you met Dan Kaufman, many of you, uh, last week. Um, and he's interested in the so-called information tsunami. So the military takes in very large amounts of information or data from many, many different sources and somehow has to manage and make sense of all of that. And so IPTO uh, is tasked uh, with developing technologies to do that. And the Microsystems Technology Office, roughly speaking, is a device technologies office, making better and better transistors, uh, finding the right junction for the function um, is uh, MTO. And then there are two uh, systems offices that build uh, prototypes and deployable systems in strategic technologies uh, for sense, primarily for sensor platforms. So things that orbit the Earth, fly, swim, uh, roll around on the ground, uh, as well as um, a considerable amount of cybersecurity uh, work that pertains to the contemporary threat, the threat that's really imminent. And then the Tactical Technologies Office uh, does much of the same thing as Strategic Technologies, uh, except uh, there are things that fly and swim and roll on the ground tend to blow up when they hit things. And so there's a, a kind of a, a set of offices like this. Regina Dugan wanted to create two new offices uh, when she came in. One is, and I think of these as uh, bookends. One is the Adaptive Execution Office. Um, and you can think of this as a kind of skunk works office. It's really looking at tech transfer and trying to really dramatically improve the quality of the technologies that are transferred out of DARPA. Uh, when there are opportunities to do so. And then the office that I was asked to create, uh, which has been given this uh, very long name uh, by the director called Transformational Convergence Technology. And it's supposed to do all of the things that I described before. Somehow engage in open innovation, anticipate strategic surprise, uh, develop next generation computing systems. And so this is what I've been asked to do. Now, um, when I, uh, try to talk to people about what we're interested in, there are different ways of slicing this. And let me say, uh, to start with, that uh, let me emphasize again that we've been in existence for four months. And so what's represented here are mostly Peter Lee's personal uh, thoughts on the matter. 
Uh, in DARPA today, with the new director, program managers really have, have a great deal of power. They're really empowered to develop and strike out uh, in uh, new directions and develop uh, their own strategies. And so the program managers that join will have a big say in what actually happens. But the thought processes that I've uh, outlined before have kind of led me, at least at this stage, after four months, to this uh, dissection of, um, of the office's technical thrust. And if you had to summarize the whole thing, it's really about developing opportunities to create exponentials, new exponential trends uh, that work in our favor or exponential trends that we can demonstrate are emerging threats. So either one of those things. And roughly speaking, I divide these into areas uh, having to do with computing, core computing, uh, communities, uh, including social communities and harnessing uh, the abilities of large numbers of people, and convergence, you know, basically bringing or uh, IT enabling uh, abilities uh, into, uh, into new domains. And so uh, what I've done here is I've tried to put uh, labels on these things in the blue, where we go from next generation computing to network systems resilience, to complex network science, uh, human machine systems, uh, all the way to radical manufacturing. And then uh, finally on the right are some of the uh, strategic thrust areas that uh, we've been really thinking about a lot and trying to develop candidate program concepts uh, around. And so this is, um, gives you kind of a snapshot of, of um, where we're at right now. And so from that foundation of computing, uh, we're really uh, trying to achieve um, uh, quite a bit, looking for and anticipating surprise in these areas. Now, um, I wanted to say just one word about programs. Um, you can already see from the DARPA network challenge, the balloon hunt, that uh, programs in our office can take all different shapes and sizes. Um, but there's a certain type of program that uh, I'm very interested in trying to develop since it pertains to uh, development of, of whole research communities. And so if we think of a research program in our office as a big triangle, um, you know, the top of this triangle is some big capability that we're trying to achieve. Uh, so think of you know, VLSI or MEMS, uh, something along those lines. And that capability, uh, I have to be able to sell to the DOD leadership. And so it has some connection to, uh, of DOD relevance, of military relevance. So if we're talking about VLSI, you know, it's, it's a connection to putting far more intelligence and precision in all sorts of platforms and devices uh, of military importance. And then supporting this program are a number of independently contracted projects. Uh, that in the case of VLSI might range from basic logic to, uh, uh, to languages for uh, network layouts and circuit uh, descriptions to uh, lithography to integrators and foundries and so on. And so all of this adds up to programs that first of all uh, are based on some capability that the whole research community that we're trying to build here is um, uh, is focused on, um, provide enough funding, sustained funding, to have a shot at realizing that capability, and then uh, contracts with a community of fully devoted researchers. And so, as I've been visiting universities, my main interest as an office director is to try to arrive at candidate uh, possibilities for what's in that yellow starburst. What is it that we could be uh, developing uh, 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 very healthy and vibrant communities around, and, and this is uh, one of my main goals. Uh, and in fact, today, a number of ideas have come up, uh, and in fact, at every place I've visited, there have been a number of ideas. And if we, as we sift through these things, uh, we hope to bring program managers on board that can develop those into full programs and really get going. Um, so where are we at? Um, it's been more than 100 days, um, but you know, 100 is a nice round number. Um, I have six program managers right now. Um, they're great. Uh, when I arrived uh, last August, I was planning for eight for this fiscal year. Uh, I think we'll be at more like 10. Um, but we won't have too many. Um, I would like one or two more 
people like me in the office. Um, and so, um, so uh, please come talk to me afterwards. Um, it's a really fun environment right now. It's like a startup. Uh, we have 27 people total. Um, so if you count all the staff and so on, it's really a small operation. Um, and it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, we have really a lot of work to do, and they're huge opportunities. Um, of course, the director is still uh, fairly new and doing more uh, internal reorganization. Um, but uh, I think that's settling down. And for our office, uh, we've just gotten to the stage now, after four months, uh, where we're poised to spend money. And I've signed my first few ARPA orders um, just, uh, just a week and a half ago. And so uh, we're, we're just now starting to spend money. And, and I'm hoping that by this time next year, um, it'll be, um, uh, that we'll be very, very busy in funding lots of great research. Um, so that's this Megatrends office. Achieve all the above. Engage in interdisciplinary research. Establish vibrant communities. Now, lastly, um, I was asked to uh, help uh, strategize with a small group and uh, with the director in re-engaging uh, with academic research. And um, one part of that was to arrange for a year-long tour of universities. And um, we did that. We started off on the West Coast, visited a few universities, and then that got written up in the New York Times. And then something like 75 invitations to visit universities rolled in. And that created a problem, because the director didn't want to play favorites, and there's no way to visit 75 places. Uh, in a year. So that tour is not really going to happen. There'll be some other type of set of regional meetings. Uh, for my part, uh, of course, I have specific interests, and so I'm trying to visit all the relevant places, and, and that's one of the reasons that I'm here. Um, but I think engaging uh, with academia is the first step. The second step is to eliminate the self-inflicted wounds that have made it hard for universities and small businesses to work with DARPA over the last few years. And so here, we've made quite a bit of progress. Uh, first of all, uh, a huge amount of power and authority has been given back to program managers. And in particular, program managers are in charge of structuring their programs and contracts uh, and of, of structuring or developing their assessment mechanisms for progress. And in particular, at least in my office, I would expect good program managers not to use 12-month go-no-go contracts. Although it's up to them, they're free to do so. Uh, but it seems true that that doesn't work well for, for university researchers. Um, second is that contracts and subcontracts to universities will be marked as fundamental research. And the immediate impact of that is that the ITAR restrictions and pre-publication review uh, requirements uh, will be lifted uh, for, the, for those research activities. And so that will make it much easier. Many, many things will be uh, made much easier for university research and for small businesses um, by doing that. And then a number of other uh, uh, changes that all have the, the same kind of flavor of just eliminating uh, senseless uh, kind of aspects of, of, uh, that have just made it hard or in, created friction in, in working with DARPA. And so I think all of that. Uh, is, is really great. And so now all we need are the great ideas to develop great programs uh, and, and get lots of people working on good things. And so what I need is I need all of you to be excited about working with DARPA. I think that looking ahead over the next two years, there are, there's just huge opportunities. One thing that we need, remember, where it's very early, so we have a deficit of ideas we need Things are really in this formative stage, so we need ideas. Um, you can communicate uh, with me or with program managers. One very good way to communicate is by providing us with white papers. Uh, talk to us. Uh, white papers, if you send them to us, someone will, will read them. We'll try to mark them up and engage with you if there's anything at all that's, uh, that's uh, interesting to us. Um, and they don't have to be long, just a couple of pages. Um, and um, look for the first couple of, of um, BAAs coming out of our office uh, over the next month. And so uh, we've had our first two program approvals, and the BAAs will be emerging uh, very shortly. Uh, and that'll be a watershed moment uh, for our new office. Uh, this last bullet, think boldly and embrace risk, 
Um, one thing that has become apparent to me is I've understood more, again, about DARPA's problems and DOD problems in various areas, such as computing architectures, networking, computer security, AI, robotics. There has been some divergence of the kinds of problems and thinking that academics have been engaged in uh, with uh, military uh, problems. For example, in networking areas, you know, it is important for the military to think about networking problems in environments and in parts of the world where there are intentional adversaries who are trying to deny uh, connectivity and access. And so it's a little bit different than the nice Web 2.0 world we live in uh, stateside. And so as we engage uh, in dialogue back and forth, uh, I'm hoping that, uh, that the thinking will become aligned and that that will create lots of opportunities. So let me uh, finish um, here before I take some questions um, and say, um, join me. It's really a historic opportunity right now. Right now, we have a new director who is just pushing ahead with just amazing force and vision. Um, and uh, I am in a honeymoon uh, period with this director and really trying to help her realize her vision for the agency. And so right now, there are just huge, huge opportunities. And uh, the impact that could be created uh, could really last for a very long time. Program managers uh, have to be really good in this new DARPA. And they really have to think big. But I'm being very careful to really limit the number of program managers in their office in order to maximize the amount of money each program manager uh, could have access to. And so if you come, uh, if you think big, you'll have a very good chance to get very large resources and do a lot. Um, and so uh, uh, I'm being very selective. Um, and so really have turned down some very, very good people uh, already um, and uh, hoping to get a few, maybe, maybe two more very, very good people. Two people just like the people in this room. Um, and if you do it, uh, you'll be a hero, um, and I think it'll be fun. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Really, uh, really appreciate it, and I'm happy to take questions. Why don't we take a couple questions, if there are some, and then uh, you can come down and talk to Peter more one-on-one. -on -one. The uh, map that you showed of the uh, student who went to North uh, Korea or Vietnam, which one? North Korea. Uh, there were there were signs about mines all over the place. What does that mean, and how did he find them? Yeah. So the question was uh, on the North Korea uncovered map. Uh, there were signs about mines. Uh, those were actually uh, mines for ore, various kinds of minerals, um, and um, so. Uh, some, there are some former military uh, personnel who were stationed in uh, South Korea and gained some knowledge just through talking to people who had relatives in North Korea. Uh, there are also people who have immigrated uh, to the U.S. and still have relatives and sometimes get information out. Um, it's really an amazing thing uh, when people are really motivated. It's not very much. Not very much. Yeah. The point here is people are really motivated uh, to uncover secrets. And, um, and so it's a competitive environment, just like anything else. Uh, a lot of your uh, motivating examples came from various areas of domain science. Can you draw a parallel between the requirements for what's going on in computationally enabled science with computationally enabled military? So the question was um, about parallels between kind of computationally enabled domain science and computationally enabled military. Um, so. Um, the, uh, uh, so one of the things that, is, um, uh, that the military faces is the need to be more and more adaptable. And in fact, there's a, another story that Regina Dugan gives. She's very zen-like in these things. Um, so if I tell you that two years from now, you have to run in a marathon, uh, you could train and probably success, successfully run that marathon two years from now. Um, but if I tell you instead that two years from now you have to run in a race, uh, you probably would not train in the same way. Uh, you wouldn't train just to run in a marathon. 
uh, you would try to train to be as adaptable as possible. And it's that scenario that increasingly the US military finds itself. You know, that every conflict presents unique challenges and that the whole military infrastructure has to adapt itself. And in fact, the business world and the tech world has realized this really long ago. We've long ago in, the, in IT have moved beyond uh, writing a requirements document for some gold-plated piece of uh, cell phone. And instead, you have to get on the bandwagon and try to get things out every eight uh, to 15 months. And so how do we uh, do that in our military systems? And that, uh, that parallel uh, is, is definitely, definitely there. And it, I think the only way to do that is to be IT enabled and in the same way that the real world is. Yes? Uh, you kept mentioning throughout the presentation about talking about uh, uh, supporting war fighters and situations that war fighters find themselves in. So obviously there's a focus on, uh, on, on looking at uh, different ways to enable them and, uh, and, and, and look at different uh, situations that they might find themselves in. But is there also, uh, are you also trying to look at uh, ways in which the concept of military defense is expanding beyond war, like war fighters as essentially soldiers in places? Yeah. Yeah, so the question was about the concept of what war fighters do, essentially, and how is that expanding? Um, and um, yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, and in fact, there's, it's one thing that I've observed, uh, and we probably all do this, is that we see the current conflicts going on, the current struggles that people are having, and we tend to think hard about all of the things that we could do now and, um, and really uh, plan to fight you know, last year's war instead of next year's. Um, so that is a, a significant issue. And that, again, drives this uh, dichotomy between optimizing for some specific task at hand versus uh, developing uh, or designing for adaptability. And so uh, exactly how uh, we can do that is unclear. In our office, we, this idea of democratization extends to the warfighter. And so there is latent innovation there. And in fact, I was really struck by a, a talk um, by a soldier who came back from Afghanistan who had lots of video that he took with his iPhone of um, the soldier's use of the MRAP. MRAP is this uh, armored personnel carrier. And it's been very successful. But it was designed to be run on paved roads. And it's being used off-road. Um, and that causes all sorts of problems. And so the soldiers actually have been more or less pimping their vehicles um, uh, to work better. Um, well, you want to enable that type of, um, that type of innovation somehow. That's exactly what. Uh, people in the tech world have figured out uh, long ago. And as, if you're able to really get that kind of adaptability, uh, then you would hope that that would transfer to whatever future jobs people might have, uh, you know, to helping people in Haiti or to, uh, to fighting the next conflict. Why don't we thank Peter? If you've got more questions, join him down here. Thanks. Thank you.